if there is one topic that has seemingly been growing when it comes to the debate table, that topic is whether or not Christians are to keep the Sabbath. Whether we're talking about Seven Day Adventists or Hebrew Roots or other groups as well, Sabbath keeping has been a hot topic for a number of years. And with me to discuss whether or not Christians are to keep the traditional Jewish Sabbath is none other than the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Doing great. Looking forward to tackling the subject. We have a lot of people that we love and care about that are well-meaning, and they're even right on doctrine in certain areas, a lot of good areas that we'd agree with, but they hold that you have to keep the seventh-day Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath of the Old Testament that was given to the Jews is binding upon the Gentile believer. And that, we believe, is a very serious error. Uh, it can be a, you know, if someone prefers to, you know, worship on the Sabbath uh, and they say, hey, I want to rest on Saturday, I just pick that day out. That's one thing. But when you, if you're teaching it that you have to keep it or you're damned or you have the mark of the beast or, you know, you, you lose your salvation if you fail to keep it, uh, then we're moving into an area that is incredibly serious. Yeah, I think this has become more and more prevalent. And I do believe a lot of it can kind of lend itself to the pendulum swinging that ha- goes on in evangelical circles, because what takes place is people see so much of the excess that is going on in so many of these, you know, seeker sensitive churches and, you know, blatantly once saved, always saved, easy beliefism churches and go, well, wait a second, you know what I'm supposed to do since yeah, I don't want to be this person that's doing whatever I want and saying I'm a believer. We need to really be following these laws and what laws should we be following And seemingly, these are the emails that we've gotten in the past are from people, and currently getting, are from people over and over again saying, well, if I'm not just going to be antinomian, which means no law without the law, then I need to be following these laws. And one specific one that always gets brought up is this one. And I I think some of the argumentation, and we'll kind of start here and kind of go forward because we want to talk about what the scripture says about this covenant that we're in. And a lot of people will point out that, hey, man, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you see the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath. And and you, you recognize that Sabbath keeping needs to be a part of these Ten Commandments that we're under and we're binding under. And the, the, the they'll say things like the, you know, you look back to creation and clearly it's the creative order. So we look back to that and recognize that the Sabbath keeping is something that is eternal even, to us. And so, so they say. Yeah. So they say. So we have a lot of we'll people. We'll repeat that very clearly in this, in this <laughs> time Amen. together. And we have a lot of people saying these kind of arguments. And I think some are well-meaning. Some people believe, as you said, you mentioned people believing this is a salvific issue or will become a salvific issue in the end times when the mark of the beast is really going to be not keeping the Sabbath and doing Sunday worship and so forth. And the the real question is, when it comes to all this, because some people just believe, well, you're losing rewards. I still believe you're a brother in Christ. Um, The real question is, is when it comes to the covenant that we are under with God, and when we look at the Ten Commandments and all the arguments that they're using, how do we differentiate? How How do we understand, as a New Testament believer on this side of the cross, how do we understand keeping the law and what covenant we're really under? Yeah, you have Church of God, uh, that Sabbatarians that keep the Sabbath. You have Hebrew Roots folks all over the internet trying to get people to keep the Sabbath and bring them under the Mosaic Law. Seventh-day Adventists, of course, Seventh-day Baptists. There's a lot of people that uh, believe you're supposed to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, the question is, was it ever given to the church? <laughs> you know, And who was it given to? Uh, it's interesting because never, nowhere in Paul's and Peter's and James and John's writings uh, do you see them saying that you have to keep the Sabbath. In fact, you see the exact opposite. In fact, it's interesting, even before God gave that law to the Jews in Israel, or I should say at Mount Sinai, uh, to go into the promised land and keep that, uh, it was never given. You never see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob keeping the Sabbath. You never see Paul chastening believers for breaking the Sabbath. He gets down on them, man. His his viceless of sinless, his sinless men are huge. (laughs) You look at Romans chapter 1. Uh, Gentiles were never called to keep the Sabbath. Uh, you, you look at his sin list in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. I think there's 16 in one list. There's several in another, and they're all different. Galatians 5 and, and, and Romans 1. Uh, and then you 
you know, adding even more to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, and Ephesians 5, uh, 4 through 6 there, and so forth. And Paul never mentions that you need to keep the Sabbath or it comes down on them for not keeping the Sabbath. In fact, the early, early church, their first uh, church council in Acts chapter 15, he warned that they weren't supposed to put the yoke of the law on the Gentile believers. And he lists a couple things that have to do with morality that they must keep, uh, like fornication, don't, don't be fornicating, and so forth. But he doesn't mention the Sabbath, of course. In fact, the scriptures say just the opposite. So I think this message, and I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, that many would be set free uh, who are well-intended, but never really looked at, looked at it closely. And we believe that we can show you in a very clear biblical way that the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, it, it wasn't taught that you had to keep the Sabbath until God rescued them out of Egypt. You don't see that it's come before that period of time as far as a, a statute that uh, anybody should keep. And then he gives it specifically to the Jews as a sign of the covenant that he makes with them at Sinai, a covenant that we aren't under. He makes a new covenant with us, and it's never given to us as part of the new covenant. Now, there's all kinds of laws that people think are good. Or, I mean, there's a law one state had for years, I think I know I need to still be in the books, that if you're driving, your wife is driving the car, you have to be like 20 feet in front of her, waving flags to warn people, okay? Now, that's not a California state law. Does it pertain to us? I don't think it even pertains or is active in the state where it was first introduced. Uh, some people <laughs> might think that's a good law, but I know a lot of women that drive a lot better than their husbands too. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I think it's interesting though because this law was never given to us. There were certain laws on the books uh, before we became a country. All kinds of different laws that the pilgrims brought and that came after that. But when there was the country became a brand new country and you had the Constitution and so forth, some of those laws were brought over and said, but they were part of the constitutional law. Other laws weren't. So to take someone and arrest them for something that wasn't on the books anymore, that was active prior to us becoming a nation, would everybody say, wait, you can't arrest them for that. That's not part of our law. Well, it was back then, and that's exactly what Sabbatarians are doing. They're saying, oh, it's based, you know, it's over here in the Old Testament, so you got to keep it. Well, who's that written to you now? Check this out. God made a covenant with the Jews after he delivered them out of Egypt, right? We call this the Old Covenant Law. And in Jeremiah 3.1, God says, I'm quoting, God says, if a husband divorces his wife because this covenant was like a marital relationship between Yahweh and Israel. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he return to her? Will not the land become completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. So he's, he says his, his, his Israel's this wife that's departed from him, has forsaken him, and can he bring her back? Or will it not pollute the land? And he's, God himself is actually quoting Deuteronomy chapter 24, which states specifically that if a man divorces his wife under the old covenant, and then she marries another man, and he dies or divorces her, if she brings him back, he can't marry her under the old covenant or to pollute the land under the old covenant. So God is saying, hey, I can't bring you back. You know, you've had all these lovers and stuff. You know, you've forsaken me. And then in Jeremiah 3.8, he says, says, and I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel. I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. So here we see that God divorces Israel under the old covenant. That's why Paul stated very clearly, there's none righteous known at one. You can't be saved under the old covenant. You had to come to Jesus as Messiah to be forgiven. So the old covenant was, is not in effect anymore. In fact, in Jeremiah 3.18, there's a prophecy. It shall be in those days that when you are multiplied and increased in the land, because he's going to bring them back, and the throne of the Lord will be in the land, it says a few verses later, declares the Lord, they will no longer say, the Jews will no longer say, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, because the Ark held the Old Covenant. They're no longer going to say, the Ark of the Covenant, and it will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made again. In fact, it seems like it's only Seventh-day Adventist Hebrew Roots people, Seventh-day Baptists and others, who are bringing the Old Covenant to mind, saying how we got to keep the, the law, and that was this, the, the Sabbath was the sign of the Old Covenant. So Jeremiah 31, 31, a little bit later in Jeremiah. Check this out. Very important. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with you, or with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, because remember, she did the same thing. Now listen to this. He's going to make a new covenant with them. Now listen, this is very important. Verse 32. Not like the covenant which I made with I, which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Catch that? Not like that covenant, not like the old covenant, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was, was, past tense, a husband to them, declares the Lord. So he's going to make a new covenant with them, 
It's not going to be like the covenant he made with him at Sinai. That one will not even come to mind. So shame on those who are saying, we're going to the old covenant saying, and, and kind of like piecemeal, oh, you got to keep this, you got to keep that, you got to keep this, you got to keep that. And now these same folks, are they being circumcised? Are they doing animal sacrifices? Are they mixing two different kinds of fabrics together? Are they doing all these? No, most of them aren't, right? And if they are, then there's a lot of scriptures in the New Testament. Uh, if you're circumcised for the sake of law, you're in big trouble. So there's a big problem here when you start going now, well, how do we know what to keep? How do we know what's binding for the believer? We're under the new covenant. So you simply read the new covenant, which is also called the law of Christ. So we see what was instituted and all of the nine commandments, since they're moral and they're eternal laws, all, all the nine of the 10, all of them are repeated in the New Testament. The only one that's not repeated, but warned against as being kept as though it's a law that you're under is the Sabbath, because that was a ceremonial aspect of the law that pointed to Christ, who is our rest. By the way, Chad and I, we both keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath we keep is our rest in Jesus. Yeah. In fact, we don't just do it one day a week. We're every day of the week Sabbath keepers because we are yoked to Jesus. He is our rest, who's freed us from the yoke of the Mosaic law and the yoke of the law that condemns of every, every human being. So we are Sabbath keepers in the sense that we keep the ultimate Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath, that's a weak and beggarly thing, Paul says, because it was simply a picture, a shadow, which we'll get into a little bit later, that pointed to Christ. And we ultimately are the ultimate Sabbath keepers because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah, I think one of the most important things that we're already establishing here is this is not simply a new covenant idea even. In terms of new covenant, when I mean the document that we have from God in our New Testament, because as Joe is mentioning over and over again, these are texts from the book of Jeremiah, which, by the way, are quoted. Great for Jews, the by the covenant. way, for witness to the Jews. Yeah, I know. I, I I could get you off on a story there of you sharing with a Pharisee down there in in Israel. That, yeah, we won't, that, we won't get done then. Yeah, we won't, but we won't get done on time. We won't, and we do want to get into these because these are really important. And I know you had mentioned already, obviously quoting from Hebrews four, which we'll get into more uh, later. End. But being diligent to enter that rest is something that's really, really important. And making sure you understand that your rest is in Christ and yeah. not simply because you take Friday sunset down until Saturday sunset. So this is important. And and I think, obviously, one of the more important things that you've brought up already, and I don't know if you're going there. Or, this is going to be beautiful. For any of you yeah. listening that are paying attention, I want you to keep going. This can be beautiful when you see how this all fits together. And you're going to say, wow, the Sabbath is very important as a picture of Christ. I have beautiful pictures of my kids, my wife, my grandkids, my my son-in-law and his <laughs> wife, which is my daughter. And all. And I love these pictures, but they, they remind me of them. But my relationship was with them. The Sabbath is a great picture of Jesus. My relationship with him, that's a mere shadow. It's just a picture. The ultimate reality is in a relationship with him. No, amen. And I, I know you're, you're playing on some text that we're going to really dig into there because that stuff is so important. And I think there's a couple of things. First of all, understanding our relationship to the scriptures in the terms of the Old Covenant, New Covenant. Yeah. And how that is with us as New Testament believers, because I know you're going to dig into specifically what is the, we're under this new covenant. So wait a second, we don't have these 613 laws of the Old Testament. So what on earth are we supposed to do? Because yeah. we're not antinomian. We believe there's still a law that we follow. Absolutely. Where it's not just, well, you know, Christ died for my sins, so I sin all the more. Wait a second. Romans 6 comes against that. But nonetheless... What, what, are, what are we even under then if we're not under this old covenant that tells us exactly, even though there needs to be Talmudic literature sometimes to help that out, according to modern day Jews, right, and so forth, what am I under and, and what am I supposed to follow? Yeah, and, and that's a good question. And, you know, sometimes Sabbatarians will say, oh, you're lawbreakers if you're not keeping the Sabbath. Well, how many tens of laws are you not keeping in the Old Testament? Well, we're not under those laws. Yeah, that's true. We're not under the Mosaic law. And the Sabbath is part of the Mosaic law. You don't want to pick and choose and put people in bondage to laws that we're not under. Unless you find them in the New Covenant, where they're expressly taught as part of the New Covenant, uh, but you have just the opposite in the New Testament. So Jesus in Luke chapter 22, he takes the cup, he takes the bread, which are symbols of his death, burial, his death for our sins, and there's burial, the resurrection. And that's what brings the New Covenant, his death for us, amen. And in Luke chapter 22, he inaugurates the New Covenant in verse 20. He says, this is the cup poured out for you, which is the New Covenant in my blood. Now it's interesting, we have a New Covenant. So we're now under the law of Christ. We were under, the Jews were under the law of Moses. The proselytes could put themselves under the law of Moses. The, the Gentile world, we weren't even under the law of Moses, right? None, none of the Gentiles were given the, uh, the Sabbath law either or circumcision and what have you. God distinguishes people. Now, it's interesting. In Galatians, it's very clear. It says this, carry each one of one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We're not under the law of Moses. 
We're under a superior law. Just read the book of Hebrews. It's far superior to the law of Moses. Well, I didn't want to go back to that, but this is, I think this makes it really clear. Paul made it clear that he was not under the law of Moses, but that did not mean he was antinomian. That didn't mean he was without law because he still had the law of God, but it differentiates that from the law of Moses. And he calls it the law of Christ. I think this is very important. Listen to what he says. And I praise God that he gives us these kinds of scriptures because it makes it so clear. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under law, as under the law. So how is Paul going to try to win Jews to Christ? He says, I come under the law, though not being myself under the law. So when he's around the Jews, he doesn't offend them, and he keeps the Jewish law. Wait a second. So you say he would do something like, I don't know, go to go to synagogues on Sabbath and go and preach there yeah. week after week? Yeah, absolutely. Like he does in Acts 17? Yeah, and then he went <laughs> among the Jews. That yeah, wasn't a church right. service, that was a synagogue service. Amen. That's why he went there to witness. <laughs> and then in Acts 20, just after that, verse 7, uh, we see the early church breaking bread on the first day of the week, which was their custom. Amen. Okay, so, which is Sunday. So it says, the law, though, not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. So when he's aroused... Gentiles, he's without the Mosaic law. But then he says, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. This is so powerful. I mean, you can meditate on 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through Amen. 21, and you can gain a lot of wisdom right there because he's clearly saying, when I'm among the Jews, I act as though I'm under the law. I don't want to offend them. I want to win them to Christ, but, I, but I'm not under the law. He goes, but I'm not without the law of God because I'm still under the law of Christ. So I'm with the Gentiles. I don't act as under the Jewish law, but guess what? I'm still under the law of Christ. So Paul makes it very clear that he's not under the law of Moses. You couldn't be. God divorced him from that. He's going to make a new covenant. Paul is the champion of grace, the champion of the new government, covenant. Now, the law of Christ is different than the law of Moses. Obviously, there's no circumcision. Uh, Jesus doesn't command uh, the, the church and say, hey, set up, set up a teaching where every, all the believers must follow the, the Sabbath now and so forth. In fact, Jesus actually totally states different things in the law of Moses. In fact, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2 the Old Testament, under the Mosaic Law, one of those 613 laws, if a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to obligate himself to, by a pledge, he must break his, check this out, he must not break his word. He must uh, do everything he has promised. So according to the Mosaic Law, if you make a vow, you know, you make your vow, then you keep it. You don't break it. But listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. This is the law of Christ, verse 33 through 37. 33 through 37. Again, you have heard it said, that to the people long ago, do not break your oath. Yeah, that's in Numbers chapter 30, verse 20, part of the law of Moses. But fulfill it to the Lord your vows you have made. Yes, we just read that in Numbers 30, verse 2. But he says, but I tell you, law of Christ now, do not swear an oath at all. <laughs> in the Old Testament, you're supposed to swear oaths. Don't swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And how does it come from the evil one? Because Satan would love to get us back under the law. He'd love us to make seven promises of the promise keeper. And I'm going to keep this. And so you bring us under condemnation. No, man. Keep, I, I promise I'll keep the Sabbath, which is basically what you have to do. I'm sorry. It's true as a Seventh-day Adventist. When you get baptized, if you want to be baptized and become a member, you have to promise to keep their teachings Make a vow. You have to make a vow. They're called vows. So this is very scary to me. And I pray that God would wake my friends up that are within those movements. I do believe there's those who have been deceived and then are seeing the truth and coming out by, by leaps and bounds, and, uh, thankfully. And hopefully this will work to the end because Hebrews chapter 8 through, 8 through 10 quotes Jeremiah 31 about how he'd make that new covenant with the church, and, and, he, and which are Jews and Gentiles, by the way. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, so the fault isn't that it wasn't perfect. It was perfect, but it couldn't save us because it finds fault with them. He finds fault with them because of his law. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant and did not care for them, says the Lord. And I keep quoting because he continues to quote Jeremiah. And he quotes part of it in Hebrews 10 as well. 
And Hebrews 10 is all about how uh, we're not under the law of Moses and the priesthood of Aaron, but we have this Melchizedek priest named Jesus who sets us free. Hebrews 8, 13, a few verses later says, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. Wow. And what is obsolete is outdated and it will soon disappear because not long after this, the temple will even be destroyed. Now listen to this, Ephesians 2, 15. Paul says, for he himself is our peace who made both groups that, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, right? Into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Check this out. How did God break down the barrier of the dividing wall that, that divided Jews and Gentiles? By abolishing, that's a strong Greek word, man, destroying. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is, what's the enmity that he destroyed? Which is the law of commandments. Wow. Wait a minute, don't we have commandments? No, he's destroying or he's abolishing the law of commandments of the old covenant, which condemned us. It was a ministry of death, the scriptures say. Okay, it was hostile to us, Colossians chapter 2 says. The ministry of death, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, abolishing by his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in him he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now, the same Greek word chat used that's translated abolished right there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, is used in Romans chapter 7, but it's translated released. I think that's really cool. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, Paul gives a marriage analogy based upon, in fact, a lot of, a lot of us scholars and commentators will call it analogy, and I'll use that term too, but actually it's more than analogy. It's a reality, okay? Because the Old Testament Jews were married to Yahweh through a covenant that they broke, and they went after false gods, which became their husbands and so forth. God divorced them, but he couldn't bring them back now to himself and save them under that covenant because it would pollute the land. How in the world can he bring them back? Well, he couldn't do it through the Old Covenant. He couldn't do that, do it through the Sabbath and all the different laws of the Old Covenant. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, this is powerful. This, you could just use this passage. And if you have an open-minded, open-hearted Seventh-day Adventist uh, or, you know, Hebrew Roots, Hebrew roots or whoever, uh, they'll see this. And Paul's addressing those who want to keep the law, a lot like the Sabbatarians. In verse 1, he says, Or do you know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released. So keep in mind, the Jews had broken that law, okay? And how can they be released from the condemnation of that law? Because they were condemned. They couldn't be brought back to salvation of the Lord. Well, he says this. They were released, and that's the same Greek word, abolished. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. It's number 2637 in Strong's, by the way. It says they were released uh, from the law. They were released from the law. They were released from the law. They were abolished from the law concerning the husband. Wow. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Okay, if her husband's alive and she's with another man, she's an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. So if her husband died, she's no longer an adulteress because she's not committing adultery on him because he's dead. That gets really heavy. So that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man, because he's dead. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who is raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. Wow. So Paul can't come back to Yahweh under the old covenant. Because guess what? Yahweh is alive. The law is in effect. The Jews are condemned, except for Messiah's coming. That's what they can hope in. Messiah comes. Guess what he does? God becomes a man and he dies on the cross. They're free from that law. He rises from the, the dead and he can bring them back to himself. Not under that law. That law condemned them. That law is not in effect anymore. He died. But he rises from the dead and now he can bring them to himself under the new covenant. The covenant of grace. You see, it just totally wipes out the idea that we are under the Mosaic law. And when somebody says, you got to keep the Sabbath, let them know, hey, I'm not under the Mosaic law. Say, well, you got to keep circumcision. No, I'm not under the Mosaic law. Exactly. That's part of the Mosaic law. Okay? For while we were in the flesh, Paul says, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit to death or for death. But now we have been released. There's that Greek word abolished again, Ephesians 2.15, which says he abolished that middle, the commandments, he says, uh, the old covenant. From the law, we are released or abolished from the law, having died 
to that by which we were bound. We died to that by which we were bound so that we may serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. That's the old covenant. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have come to know coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. Paul's talking about the Mosaic law there. He even brings up a moral aspect of it. Okay, We're not under any of the old covenant law. Well, wait, but what about the moral commandments? Yes, we keep them as part of the new covenant law. It's got to get that through your mind. You're under the new covenant law. So if someone says to you, hey, look at what it says in the old covenant, man. You got to do this and do that or the other. And Hey, you just got married. The old covenant says you're supposed to take a year off. You know, don't go to work for a year. No, you're not under that law anymore. Yeah, and I think it's good also to point this out because I think a lot of people, when they come to just scripture as a whole, and we all pick up our Bibles and we see it says Old Testament and New Testament, right? And, and, so, something. and so we're reading that. And I think the better translation would be New Covenant and, and Old, covenant. And, old covenant. and when you had that covenantal document of the Old Testament that we mm-hmm. have today, then you have the New Covenantal document. That's a document that God himself instituted for us so that we would know blood. how to walk. <laughs> and that's exactly what the Old Testament did when we, when the Jews had that book. And we see it in Nehemiah when they get rereading the law and then they translate it to them so they better understand right. it in chapter 8. It is so important for us to understand this relationship to the covenant and the documents that we have, because when it comes to the new covenant, having that document that tells us how to walk in a manner worthy of our calling tells us how we are in that covenant, just as the old covenant did and in with that covenant. And we see that and now know how to walk in it. And this is why Jesus can describe under the new covenant exactly what we're going to have in our the greatest commandment. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and one like it, to love your neighbor as yourself, in Matthew chapter 22, and then says, this summarizes what? Basically, when he says the law and the prophets, Mm -hmm. I know he uses in Luke, he also uses the terminology, the trifold uh, understanding of the Old Testament, but right there, when he's saying summarizing the law and the prophets, he's summarizing all of the Old Testament there, and saying right here, loving the Lord thy God with thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, will, guess what, will be a part of the new covenant that we have with him. That's right. He said he would fulfill it, which he did on the cross. Amen. He paid for every sin that was ever committed against the law, you know. And some will say, oh, but not one jot or tittle. But then they'll say, oh, except for circumcision. Oh, except for this. Oh, except for that. It's like, wait a minute, what happened to that one jot or tittle? They're, they're obviously condemning themselves if they don't keep those things. Well, those are fulfilled in Christ. Yes, so is the Sabbath. That's our argument. And Amen. we'll see how the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ uh, more deeply in a minute. By the way, that word abolish, you know, that same word comes up in, in 2 Corinthians. And well, some will say, and some of our Seventh-day Adventist friends and, and uh, others in the Hebrew Roots Movement stuff, they'll say, well, when he's talking about the law, and the, he's not talking about the, the, the law engraved on stone, written the ten, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments at all. That's not what he means about being abolished. That's, you want to bet? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. By the way, that same word abolished used in Romans 7, 1 through 7, and in Ephesians 2, 15 is used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. And let me read it to you. Paul says, And he has qualified us as ministers of a new covenant, not the, not the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills. That's right. The old covenant, man, boom, it kills you. But the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, he calls the old covenant with the Sabbath laws and so forth, a ministry of death in letters. Now check this out. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones, brothers, sisters, engraved on stones, talking about the Ten Commandments specifically right there, came with glory. So the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his faith. Uh, face. Now, it's interesting. I've got four things here. The ministry, it's called the ministry of death in verse 7. Letters engraved on stone in verse 7. Verses 9 through 11, it's called the ministry of condemnation, and it's abolished, it says, verses 9 and 11, talking about the same law engraved on stones. It's called the Old Covenant. It's abolished again, verse 14, okay? Uh, and then he says in verse 10, but... Whenever a person turns the Lord, the veil, speaking of the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law, is abolished or taken away. It's translated with the same Greek word, abolished. So it's interesting. Paul uses this word, and he and we know what he's doing there. He's using it consistently, never saying keep the Sabbath, never saying keep the Law of Moses, but saying that he's under the Law of Christ. Now, it's interesting because uh, I've mentioned a few times that it's a, it's a sign that was given to them, but I think it's important now— uh, and I think there's so many devastating passages against keeping the Sabbath as a law in the New Covenant. 
It's not that he just doesn't list it as among the sins that they're committing if they're not keeping the Sabbath. It's not that he just doesn't, if they fail the New Testament writers to command New Covenant believers to perpetually keep the, the, the Sabbath law. It's that he warns against the, the doctrine that would teach us that we must keep it. And I think this is important. So in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it says, Paul says, and this is powerful because if you look at the background and of, of the, the Colossians, they were being influenced by this hyper mysticism mixed with the, uh, the Jewish law by uh, Judaizers that were mystical and so forth. And, and Paul says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge. You ever get judged by uh, Seventh-day Adventist or Hebrew roots people say, you got to keep the Sabbath. Well, he says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink. Now, many Seventh-day Adventists are in a very strict, you know, food loss, right? But he says, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. He says, now this is very important, verse 17, things which are a mere shadow. The Sabbath day and these festivals are a mere shadow of what is to come but the substance belongs to Christ. So these were shadows. Just as you, you know, I could see shadows, you know, behind my hands right now. And those shadows are, they kind of depict what my hand is, but this is the reality. The Sabbaths were a picture of the reality and the rest that we'd have in Jesus. You're not supposed to be judged based on the shadow and whether you keep that shadow or not. And that's very, very important. Just as I said, the picture of my wife, I don't kiss a picture of my wife. I have my wife to kiss, you know. I, the shadows are mere shadows that point to Christ. But the key here is interesting What's he talking about? He says, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? What's the context? Why are we not to, supposed to allow people to judge us and, as to whether or not we're keeping the Sabbath and, and, and say, hey, man, you got to keep the Sabbath if you're going to be right with God? Well, back up a little bit, and we see in verse 10, and in him, that's in Jesus, you have been made complete. That's because our rest is in him. Those were mere shadows in the Old Covenant. We're not under the Old Covenant Sabbath law. That was given to the Jews. That was given to Israel, okay? Never to the Gentiles, never to the church. And he says, we're complete in Christ because he's the substance. They pointed to the rest that we have in him, man. We used to want, we couldn't be right with God. We were laboring if you, you know, whatever system you were part of or doing your own thing or whatever, you were enslaved to sin and Jesus set us free. And he is the head overall rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision. Now this is heavy because he's going to another sign of the old covenant, which was circumcision. And he says, you were circumcised, not with a circumcision made without hand. I'm sorry. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That's the circumcision of the heart, he calls it in Romans chapter 2. In which the removal, and he says, and uh, the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we are circumcised spiritually by Christ. We don't need to be physically circumcised. And he's basically showing that physical circumcision, that cutting away of the flesh, was a picture of what happens with us in Christ where we're separated from our old life through what Jesus did on the cross. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of your transgressions, having, check this out, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The Sabbath was nailed to the cross, brothers and sisters. Okay? Verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through the cross. Now, let me read these verses again. Therefore, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day which these things are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. I think it's very important that we understand this. This right here is a formula. This isn't like Paul's just coming up with these three terms, a festival, okay, which be it, the yearly festivals, right? A new moon, which be the monthly festivals, or a Sabbath day, which would be that weekly Sabbath. And uh, I, don't, I don't have a hard time of it. Some like to apply it, say, oh yeah, it probably applies to the uh, festival Sabbaths as well. I don't think it has to because the festivals are already mentioned. Okay, so I believe it for sure uh, imbibes the weekly Sabbath. So he has a division, a threefold division of the yearly yearly festivals, the, the monthly, the new moons, and then the weekly. He, he does that. And we see that throughout the Old Testament that God groups them together, including the Sabbath. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 23, 31, I had like eight or 10 verses I was going to share on this. I'm going to share a couple. Uh, he warns, behold, I'm about to build a house. This is the Jews, right? Israel, uh, for the name of the Lord, my God, and dedicate uh, him burning incense, sweet spices before him, and the regular uh, arrangement of the showbread for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbath. 
and the new moons and the appointed feast of the Lord, our God, as ordained forever for Israel. So they had these Sabbaths they had to keep every week and then a special Sabbath on the feast days, but he's covered that with the feast. And, and uh, we, when we see this, why would Paul, by the way, if he's just talking about Sabbaths that have to do with festivals, why would he be being redundant? Because if he's saying festivals and then the new moons, why would he bring up and a Sabbath day? Unless he's speaking of the Sabbath days. And by the again, we're not under that old covenant. So just you can't say, oh, but you've got to keep that because you have no scripture to back that up. In fact, we see that same division in Ezekiel 45, 17. And I will put an end to all her myrrh, her feast, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feast. So, I mean, we this over and over again. So we're not to be judged by these things. Yeah, I think that's important because one of the things that people, here, here are a couple of arguments because um, I want to go through three different arguments with you that I've had sent to us when we've talked about this text specifically. One of them is the fact that the plural is used, and I know you've talked about that already, but then there's the fact that there's no definite article when it comes to the Sabbath, right? They're in Colossians 2, 16 and, uh, specifically. Yeah. There's no definite article, so there's just Sabbaths, but there's no definite article. How would we counteract somebody saying, hey, there's no definite article, so it's not talking about the Sabbath, which we all need to keep? First, I'd say, so what does that mean if there's no different article there? Then the follow-up will be, because many of them heard from their preachers. Okay, I'm sorry. I see it all the time on the internet where Sabbatarian teachers, okay, either in deception or in ignorance, and maybe their leaders don't know sometimes, give them benefit of the doubt, God knows the heart. Uh, they'll say, yeah, it's uh, in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, when it mentions Sabbath there, they'll say, uh, there's there's no definite article there. So it's not talking about the Weekly Sabbath, because the ho would be there, the, the, the Sabbath, like the boat or versus a boat. Uh, and then they'll say, oh, it's also, yeah, another argument, separate argument. Sometimes they're used together to have more force. The Greek word there is sabaton, and sabaton is plural. So whenever the weekly Sabbath is being talked about, it's never used in the plural. Both of those things are grossly wrong. We could give several examples of where they're wrong. Uh, uh, four or five examples very easily on how the plural is used of the weekly Sabbath, or four or five examples of how uh, there's no definite article used of the weekly Sabbath as well. But I'll give one example, because it actually is one example that refutes both arguments, and people could remember it. And that's when Jesus resurrects from the dead, and in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, when he's resurrected, it talks about he, how he rose, right? And they came to see him on the first day of the week, okay? And it says, after the Sabbath, but in the Greek, there's no the, Okay, and I've looked it up in my interlinear. It's opsa, okay, which means after, and sabaton, which is plural, by the way. No, no after the in the Greek, no ho. There's no, it's just after Sabbath. It's not a definite article. And it's referring to the weekly Sabbath, obviously, because it's talking about the first day of the week right after the weekly Sabbath. And it's sabaton, and it's plural. So unfortunately, you see this argument over and over again, but it's not a honest argument. Now, a lot of people that use it just don't know better. They haven't checked it out and actually did a search on it. So it seems to have force when it's preached from the, the Hebrew Roots people. and It's typically online videos. Yeah, and I was going to say from the pulpit, the Hebrew Roots people typically don't even go to churches unless it's to draw people away from them, unfortunately. Not always the case, but typically. Uh, so, by the way, Strong's, uh, Strong's definition of sabaton, using Colossians 2, 14 through 17 there, of Hebrew origin of Sabbath, that is Shabbat, or day of weekly repose, or day of weekly repose from secular evocations. Also, the observance of or institution itself, by extension, speaks of the interval between two Sabbaths. Likewise, the plural in all the above applications, Sabbath day, week. By the way, there's been a number of, uh, of Seventh-day Adventist theologians who have admitted that, yeah, it's speaking of the weekly Sabbath there. Some actually have had left the movement. Even some of their theologians, they realized, wait a minute, this is the weekly Sabbath. It's devastating uh, to their argument. So it's interesting because look at the very next verse, Chad. Can you read verse 18? Right after he warns not to let anybody judge you because now you can take that scripture to them and you can say, hey, look at Paul wrote this letter here in Colossians and you shouldn't be being, being, bringing people under the law of Moses, under the Old Covenant Sabbath law that was given to the Jews. You say that to them, and thus say it the Word of God. Well, guess what? Since they can't beat you on Scripture, mm, they can't, really. It's 
it's an ironclad case against Sabbath keeping and trying to keep the old part of the old covenant to be justified before God. Uh, what do they do? They turn to mysticism, spiritual experience. Well, God revealed to me, you know, in fact, that's exactly what he warns about next. Yeah, and, and I want to read that. Verse. I just wanted to point, and this one's really quick, and because I, I want to give the, the third argument that this was written actually on our most recent 511 News episode, uh, specifically when I talked about Jesus Christ being our rest and when I talked about Colossians 2, 16 and 17, somebody said, well, look, when you read Colossians chapter 2, 16, it's actually saying you can't judge us for keeping the Sabbath. So I don't mean to laugh. That's, there's going to be, sad. yeah, there's going to be a problem there because here's the context of I'd that like to Sabbath. I'd even one commentator that would dare say such a thing. It's not the context at but, all. But, and even if it is, let's say it is, it's still pointing to the same thing, even if you are keeping the Sabbath. And maybe it's a Romans 14 situation where you call one day holier than the other, let you be convinced in your mind in that regard, if you're not putting that yoke on someone else. But here's the problem. Verse 17, the problem with taking a text out of its context is that context come back and it knocks on your door and it says, wait a second, things, including what? The new moon, the, right. fee, the festivals, the Sabbath. That's right. We're a mere shadow yeah. of what is the, what the to come. The context is those are a shadow of the reality in Christ. So don't anybody judge you for not keeping the shadow. It's an obvious context. Obvious and, context. And, and so I've if you think so that, many, I've never even seen anybody. I, I haven't seen a Seventh-day Adventist. Don't even, I don't think their leaders say that. Yeah, That's, I haven't I, seen I, that. It's not, I wouldn't, be, wouldn't be their typical... They believe it's referring to the ceremony law and that it's not referring to one of the Ten Commandments. We've just shown how we're not under the Ten Commandments, though. Yeah, amen. Okay, so let's get back the to very next what verse you were right after the two Verse red. 18 says, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Right, so now his concern that his writing, even though he's writing under with apostolic authority, the word of the Lord inspired by the Holy Spirit, that there'll be those that dig their feet in the ground because their leaders are saying, but there was a special vision an angel gave me and showed me how important it is to keep the Sabbath or that we don't eat pork or that we don't eat lobster or whatever. And Paul's warning against that because he knows it's coming. That's what, There's so many ways you could prove the word of God is the word of God, but the prophetic intuition that Paul has could only come by the Holy Spirit where he foresees this coming because this is exactly how the Seventh-day Adventist movement was built. Because before Seventh-day Adventism, when you look at the early founders of what became the Seventh-day Adventist movement, first you see Muller, you see the Seventh-day Baptist. That's where they got that. And Ellen White, who became the main prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, claims that she disagreed with their, the emphasis on trying to keep on keeping the Sabbath. And she said, there should be emphasis on the other commandments that aren't being emphasized. And then she said the Lord gave her a vision, and it was an angel. And it's almost like, you know, right out what we're reading out of here, you know, and that she was taken to heaven by this angel. And this angel totally contradicts what God writes through the Apostle Paul here in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, on pages 95 and 96 of Life Sketches of Ellen G. White, which is, by the way, published by the Seventh-day Adventist, this book. It states, Elder Bates was resting upon Sunday, the seventh day of the week, and he urged it upon our attention as the true Sabbath. It did not feel, so she's already under this teaching, right? It didn't feel, it's, I didn't feel its importance as, and, and thought he erred in dwelling upon the fourth commandment more than upon the other nine. But the Lord gave me a view of the heavenly sanctuary, okay? By the way, she has false prophecies. And if you're Seventh-day Adventist, just Google Ellen White's false prophecies, and they're all over the place. But she says, the Lord gave her a view of the heavenly uh, sanctuary. The temple of God was open in heaven. And I was shown the ark of God covered with the mercy seat. Two angels stood, one on either end of the ark, and their wings spread over the mercy seat, and their faces turned toward it. This, uh, my accompanying angel, so now she's got this spirit, which is not an angel of God, I believe at least a demonic entity. This, my accompanying angel, informed me, represented all the heavenly hosts, looking with reverential awe toward the law of God, which had been written by the finger of God. You mean the one that Paul said was abolished, that we are released from? Uh, Jesus raised the cover of the ark. So then Jesus raises the cover of the ark in her vision. And behold, and, be, and I beheld the tables of the stone on which the Ten Commandments were written. I was amazed as I saw the fourth commandment. That's the, that's the Sabbath commandment the Sabbath given to... Yeah the Jews at Sinai, which they're not anymore, by the way. 
I was amazed as I saw the fourth commandment in which the very clear center of the 10 precepts with a soft halo of light encircling it. <laughs> so it's like, it, what's the first of the 10 commandments, by the way? That's re, and it's repeated in the New Testament to have no other gods before him, right? Mm-hmm. You know, but this one becomes the, the most important one. Said the angel, it is only one of the 10 which defines the living God who created the heavens and the earth and all the things that are therein. Now, in her early writings, Ellen G. White again, page 33, but the fourth, the Sabbath is a shorter, shorter one, but it's more to the point. But the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, she says, shown above them all, recounting the same vision that this angel gives her. For the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. The holy Sabbath looked glorious. A halo of glory was all around it. Now, what's, listen to this. There's a halo around it. You know, I saw that the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross. Wow. Yeah, especially when Paul says it was, and God says it was. And now this is what's scary to me, right? We saw that Jesus brought in a new covenant, and part of his new covenant is it's the law of Christ, right? And part of the law of Christ is we're not supposed to make vows now. You know, we're not supposed to make oaths, and we're not supposed to swear, but let your yes be yes, your no be no, because anything beyond that is from the evil one. So if I promise that I'm going to keep part of the Mosaic law, which I'm not under, Satan can bring me back under condemnation. Well, guess what? As I alluded to earlier, the official SDA baptismal vows, the Seventh-day Adventist baptismal vow, vow number 11 says, I know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught. I know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist church, which includes keeping the Sabbath. It is my purpose, by the grace of God, to order my life in harmony with these principles. Now, from now, you're supposed to follow those creed, their creed, right? Now, from the 27... Fundamental beliefs of the official Seventh-day Adventist Creed, which you just now vowed to keep. Number 17 says this, that you believe in the gift of prophecy. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift, and I'm quoting from it, this gift is an identity. You can just go to the Seventh-day Adventist site and look at their creed. It's there. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifest in the ministry of Ellen G. White as the Lord's messenger. Her writings are continuing an authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. So if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you go here and say, wow, Jeremiah, we're not under the Old Covenant. He divorced him under the Old Covenant. Oh, we're under the New Covenant. And we're not supposed to be bound and trying to keep the laws of the Old Covenant. Oh, praise God. Okay, I need to just follow the law of Christ. And guess what? Boom, all of a sudden you're corrected by her prophecies because she's seen an angel, this inflated vision, which Paul warns about. And boom, all of a sudden you are under, and you're making a vow, which you said is not part of the New Covenant to keep a vow, to make these vows. And you're making a vow to keep this at your baptism. To me, it's a crafty, satanic deception. And it breaks my heart, but that's reality. I got to say that, you know, and I love Seventh-day Adventists and many of them just really seem to, to, to want to do God's will and so forth. But Jesus said, if you will to do the will of the Father, you'll know the truth, right? The truth sets us free. And Jesus sets us free from such bondage. Yeah, it's interesting though, because even in the prophecy that, you know, supposedly the angel told her to say that that's the only command that really identifies him. I mean, the very first one, I am the Lord, yeah, your God, that's right. who took you out of the land of Egypt. He's already saying he's a deliverer. That's right. From the very first very command. Good, Chad. Yeah, amen. Could you imagine saying that there's only this one, this one command, that's the one that identifies who he is? This is her prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. That's false right from the first command. Yeah, right from as the first command. As soon as I, because I have been familiar with that quote, you know, obviously, I, you know, here and there, but to hear it actually spelled out that way is, is really something that if you have not, and sadly, you know, um, so many people that even love the Good Fight Ministries channel, and I'm sure there's t- going to be a ton of people that unsubscribe because of this. But the reality is people will write on there, you need to read The Great Controversy. you got to read Ellen G. White. Uh, as if this is, it, it makes no sense to me. And when it comes to that, that there's going to be this elevated keeping the Sabbath holy, remembering the Sabbath, and all of a sudden that ties itself to yeah, other things and, as well. And if they really love the Lord... Uh, rather than reading the great controversy, read the Word of God, read the New Covenant, read Deuteronomy 13 if you want the old. And praise God, there's good teaching of the Old Testament. We're not bound by the laws and statutes of the Old Covenant law. But in Deuteronomy 13, the Lord says He'll allow false prophetesses like her to come along and to have dreams, and and even the dreams that come to pass. So something's come to pass to lead them away from the true God to see if they love Him with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. God allows us to be tested to see if we're going to put Him first or we're going to put Ellen G. White first. You know. And I think this is important. Now, it's interesting because in Galatians, the whole book of Galatians is against this idea of 
You got to keep parts of the Mosaic law to be right with God. Because Paul says you're going to pick and choose which parts of the Mosaic law to keep. Then you got to keep the whole thing. Because if you break one law, the whole law condemns you. James chapter 2, also Galatians uh, chapter uh, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. In Galatians 1, Paul says, I marvel, I'm blown away, modern vernacular, that you're so quickly being removed from the grace of him who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, 8, 9, if we or an angel from heaven, i.e. what happened to Ellen White, preach another gospel to you than that which we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. I say again to you, if another, if an angel preach another gospel, let him be eternally condemned or cursed, anathema in the Greek. And in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, who has bewitched you? And then in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, he uses the same formula of the yearly and monthly and day, Sabbath day formula that's throughout the Old Testament, warning them that they go back to the law of Moses, because that's what Paul's writing about in Galatians, about going back to the law of Moses. We read this. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things, to which you desire to be enslaved all over again, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Now, everybody knows uh, the context is Paul's coming against the Judaizers who are trying to get them to keep the law of Moses. And Paul says in Galatians 5, a few verses later, verse 1, he says, stand fast to the believers who aren't under that yoke who the Judas is trying to deceive. So you got to keep the Sabbath, man. you got to be circumcised. Paul says, stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has set you free. It's a present tense imperative. Continue to stand fast. That's a commandment. That's a commandment of Christ, right? Stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has set you free. Don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. He says, if any of you are circumcised, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to be right with God, to be justified, he says, you'll be cut off from the Christ. You've fallen from grace and so forth. So that's absolutely important. Now, this is very, very critical that we understand. I know our time is winding down a little bit here. So I think what we need to get to this is, the Old Covenant, the, the, the law, it commemorated, the, I'm talking about the Old Covenant law or sign of their being delivered from Egypt. The, the, the Sabbath day was to commemorate a day of rest because God gave them a day of rest because they were enslaved, working their tails off, working their rear ends off for years and years and years in Egypt, and God set them free. He gave them a day of rest to commemorate him leaving, them leaving slavery. That didn't happen to us, okay? Something else happened to us. And there's a different sign that we're given. Now, I think it's important uh, that we understand this because under the Old Covenant, okay, and we'll get into this in a minute, we're going to see explicitly in the Scripture that we are told very, very clearly in the Scripture that that was a sign of the Old Covenant. But what happened in the New Covenant? This is what people miss. The Old Covenant sign was, circumcision was a sign that you were, had accepted the Old Covenant law or you had been born into it, and then you'd have to accept it in your heart, Right? But then there was keeping the Sabbath day. That was, God said, because I delivered you, it's a sign that I delivered you out of Egypt. That was a sign of the old covenant, brothers and sisters. Now think about this. This is very, very important that you get, you get this and understand. That was a sign of the old covenant. What is a sign of the new covenant? He delivered them, then they rested on the seventh day, right? Well, when did Christ rise? First day of the week. The first day of the week. That brought in the new covenant, Okay. His resurrection brought in the new covenant. So you could divide history if you're going to divide it by two covenants. It would be the old and the new. Christ brought in the new covenant. What was the sign of the new covenant? They rested or they celebrated on the first day of the week. Okay, In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Paul says, when you gather together on the first day of the week, you know that's when you're supposed to take your offerings. Why? Because the early church met on the first day of the week. Uh, we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that they gathered together to break bread, and we understand that to be communion, on the first day of the week. And it's kind of like you write, read, you know, to keep in the old covenant, keep the Sabbath day. Amen, right? Well, this was, they met on the first day of the week, and it was also called the Lord's Day. For, in Revelation chapter 1, John calls it the Lord's Day. Uh, do we really think he's saying that? Well, the same adjective for Lord's Day is used of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's the Lord's Supper, and it's the Lord's Day, and they would take the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. And we know that from the earliest church writings, which we'll get into it whole other study coming up, we're going to get into the church fathers, fathers of course, that they understood the first day of the week to be a day to commemorate the Lord in the Lord's Day. And that was a sign of the new covenant for the New Testament Christian, where you see over and over again, they're getting together on the first day of the week, they're taking their offerings the first day of the week, they're, they're breaking bread on the first day of the week, and it's called the Lord's Day throughout the early church fathers, the first day of the week. It's also called the eighth day of the week in the church fathers, which we won't get into now. Mm -hmm. But I'll say this, 
It wasn't just, and this is really heavy, because seventh day Adventist friends will say to us, you know, in Hebrew roots, well, it was it, it, he rested on creation. That's not why he says he gave it to him. It was to commemorate their leaving out of Egypt. Yes, he reminds them he rested on creation, but that fits something totally different as far as that's the Sabbath we keep. That's the day that he continues to rest, and we enter into that rest. Chad and I believe that. Yeah, every day we're in that rest, okay? Mm -hmm. But guess what? There was the old creation, and then there's the new creation. And that day of rest was a picture of, yes, you could say to a degree, the old creation, perhaps, not just leaving Egypt. But guess what? Why do, we, why do we meet on the first day of the week? Guess what? Because we are new creations. Because it's not just about the new covenant, it's also about the new creation. The Bible says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away and all things become new. Hebrews 5, 17. In Galatians 6, when he says we're under the law of Christ and not to go back to the law of Moses, he talks about the circumcision or non-circumcision that avails nothing. He says, but a new creation. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he talks about how we are his workmanship. Amen. We are his creation. Okay. Uh, we're his poema, okay, uh, his, his workmanship, and we are his new creations. So as new creations, w when, did, when did we become new creations? When did we have that opportunity? When Jesus rose from the dead, he became the firstborn among many brethren, okay, because of his resurrection. It ties him becoming the firstborn among many brethren to his resurrection, and we celebrate. Now, we don't come together because we worked our tails off in Egypt for all these years and have a day of rest. We come together on the first day of the week because we've been delivered from sin, and bondage and darkness. And we come together to celebrate and get all excited about Jesus, you know, and, and just worship our Lord and give him praise and honor because he's so worthy. Uh, and so, I mean, there's so many things we can go into, but we want to, we're covering a lot of ground here, which I'm grateful for. But we're going to do one more on this in the future, not in not too distant future, where we go through the church fathers and we go through uh, the eternal rest that we've been talking about. That the scripture is very clear, clearly showing you that the Sabbath will not be a perpetual thing into eternity. Amen.